Well, good morning, Walden Church. So, it's Olympics week. The Olympics began this week. They're going to continue on uh, for the next week. My wife and I, uh, we've been watching every night. Some of it uh, can be pretty fast-paced, pretty exciting. We watched uh, Women's Foil, and that was the first gold medal for the USA. That's Lee Kiefer right there. She's our gold medal winner. And this is Anastasia Zolotik. She's the first American woman to win gold in Taekwondo. And our family was super excited to watch skateboarding. Skateboarding because as a sport, before this year, skateboarding has never been in the Olympics. And if you happen to watch it, it was a lot of falling. It was a lot of falling, lots of brave attempts lots of falling, especially amongst the men. Uh, the women, they stayed on their boards a little bit better. And you'd think with all the skateboarders that are in the United States, we'd have done well. No. Uh, men, we got bronze and the women uh, got fourth place. Well, I was getting prepared for our talk today and uh, I was somewhat uncomfortable about this passage from Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, and I was reminded of a term that teenagers used to use back in the 1980s, and that's the word poser. I was a rock and roll high school kid. This is my senior portrait. My mother was so proud. But us rock and roll kids, we called ourselves rockers, and we tried our best to be true, to be authentic, and we had a word for the kids who tried to be in our group, but they didn't know the culture and they especially didn't know the music. They just wanted to look like us. They wanted to associate with us and they tried to do that by how they dressed and we called them posers. Surprisingly, kids today, they still use the word poser, but now it has more to do with skateboarding. There are kids who want to wear skateboard clothing. They want to wear the shoes. They might even carry a skateboard around, but they don't skateboard. Or they only skateboard very little. There are even YouTube videos out there called How to Spot a Poser. What's a poser? The definition of a poser is someone who is pretending to be something they're not. Or a person who, by doing that, is trying to impress other people. It's when you try to say the right thing or uh, do the right thing, but inwardly you're a fake. You want to look like you talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. A poser is a fake, a phony, a wannabe. Jesus comes and delivers his famous Sermon on the Mount, and he does so in a time when the wrong information was floating around. And Jesus preaches it to correct it all. He pushes the reset button. He says, let's do it over. You think it's one way, I'm here to say it's actually this way. And here in chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus doesn't pull any punches. His tone has gone from, make sure you're on the narrow road, make sure you're not listening to any bad influences, and now he's going to say, make sure you're legit. Make sure you're not a poser. Make sure you're not a fake. Are you a real follower? Or are you only a Christian on the outside? Do you just dress like a Christian? Just talk like a Christian? Do you just do the things that Christians do? Are you legit? Jesus is pretty straightforward here. He's very matter of fact. He's to the point. And this passage can make us feel uncomfortable. I get it. So if you're uncomfortable with these verses, you are not alone. Jesus says in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's pretty scary, right? I mean, for a Christian, when we read that, what's going through your mind? If you were in a classroom and the teacher said that, if you were in the locker room and your coach said that, you'd be thinking, is he saying this to everyone in the room or just me? Is he talking to me? Jesus 
doesn't pull any punches. No posers. I look back through that verse and I think to myself, well, I pray, Lord, Lord. Well, there were people back then who would call Jesus Lord, but they didn't mean God. They called him rabbi. They called him great teacher. But it was just a formal greeting. They were just paying him lip service. They were just being social. But Jesus is clear. Just because you use Christian words doesn't mean you're a Christian. What about people who prophesy? Jesus says, even those who prophesy? How can someone be a fake prophet? Well, this would be someone who is speaking with authority. They're telling people, this is what God told me. Hey, everyone listen to me. This is the word of the Lord. But it's not God's authority. It's not God's word. They're just using God's name. They're just using God's image, trying to attract more followers. And Jesus just finished giving a warning to his followers, talking about false prophets, listening to them, and now he's addressing the false prophets that are in the room. What about someone who casts out demons? Jesus says, even people who cast out demons. That, that can't be right. But remember, people were very superstitious back then. And back then, almost everything that uh, you, was ailing you, they would associate to demon possession. Sore throat, probably a demon. Trouble sleeping, I blame demons. And someone could just set up some sort of scam business fake demon buster. Jesus even says, people who do mighty works in my name. They just slap God on the outside. Just slap the name Jesus on the outside with a bumper sticker. You've been there, right? Uh, someone's describing something and maybe even something that they did and they'll say, it was a God thing. Or, you know, and then God showed up. But what about all the ordinary day-to-day -day things? You know, flowers. Flowers grow. That's a God thing. Rain falls. That's a God thing. That doesn't mean you're a follower. So what are you supposed to do? Well, fortunately, in the passage, Jesus tells us. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So a follower is the one who does the will of God. Do we do the will of God? What is the will of God? Here in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is pushing that reset button on faith. Jesus says, faith is not what you think it is. Being a follower, being a disciple, isn't what you think it is. It isn't using Christian words. It's not preaching. It's not even casting out demons. It's not even great and mighty works. Jesus' disciples are doing the will of God. Don't be a poser. You can't fake it until you make it. Is behavior important then? Sure, but behavior comes after your faith. To be a disciple, Jesus doesn't say, behave better. He says, believe more. So why does Jesus feel called to push the reset button right here? Why is this important to Jesus? Well, because I think we get confused a lot about what we are all supposed to be doing down here. Humans, we love checklists. We love projects. We love to-do lists. We love accomplishing things and getting things done and checking things off. We believe actions speak louder than words. So we want to look the part. We want to check things off. But the Bible is not an instruction manual. And Jesus wants a relationship with us. We read John 15 a couple weeks ago. I want to reread it today and then maybe go a little further than we did last time. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, 
that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. It's kind of the same message, right? Jesus basically says the same thing. Jesus says, if you bear fruit that glorifies God, you prove to be Jesus' disciples. We know the disciples, right? Andrew, Simon Peter, James, Zebedee, John Zebedee, Philip, Nathaniel, Matthew, Levi, Thomas, James, and Judas Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas Iscariot. We, we elevate these 12 individuals. It's almost like they're, they're, they're second unto Jesus, right? I mean, Jesus is here, and the 12 disciples are right here. I mean, they're, they're up there. But here Jesus says the proof of a disciple is someone who bears fruit that glorifies God. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus looks around at some of those who are watching, and he says, hey, there are some of you here, right? There are some of you here that if you showed up to my house, I would open the door and say, who are you? I don't know who you are. I'm not letting you into my house. No, Jesus says he only invites in those who are his disciples. We read Jesus' warning about fakes and phonies in the Sermon on the Mount, and our first question would be, will I enter the kingdom of heaven? Am I a disciple? John 8, Jesus said to those who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. What is a disciple of Jesus? What does it take to be one? Is there a way to know? I should go to church, right? I should be a good person, right? I mean, is, is that all there is? Is there a set of rules to follow? Is there a checklist? Are you a disciple if you took a, a four-week class a discipleship class uh, at your church? Why can't the Bible just spell it out? Why, why can't it just all be in one place with easy diagrams and pictures? Well, I believe the keys to discipleship, I believe they're there, but it has just as much to do with faith as it does with how we act. First, I would say a disciple is a minister. A disciple is a minister or, or a priest. You're, you're continuing the mission of Jesus on earth. You are his ambassador here on earth. You are sharing his message of reconciliation with others. Exodus 19 says, you shall be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. At Walden Church, we say it like this. We say every member is a minister because you are a member of a royal priesthood. You are given one task, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Jesus serves, and so his followers serve. Second, I would say a disciple is full-time. This is a full-time job. It's not a part-time profession. This is, this is not a Sundays-only gig. This is a lifestyle of love and grace. Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. Picking up your cross has a fatality to it. It has a destination. There are no breaks. There's no timeouts. There's no vacations. In Ephesians, Paul says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should all walk in them. Third, a disciple is a witness of Christ. Jesus gives us the privilege. He gives us the authority to tell others what he has done in our lives. He wants you to share your testimony with others. And that's an essential part of what it means to be a disciple. Mark 16, Jesus says, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. The disciple then becomes a living testimony of all of God's amazing grace, all of Jesus' power. A disciple, their lives are forever marked by the change that has taken place. In Acts 1.8, Jesus promises us power from the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses, he says, to the ends of the earth. In Matthew 28, God gives us his commission to go out and spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. And it's a command. It's called the great commandment. It's not called the great suggestion. To be a witness 
All you have to do is share your story and the Holy Spirit will do the rest. Fourth, a disciple is a Christian leader. Jesus called his disciples. He called them away from the lakeside and he said, follow me. And then for the next three years, he spent uh, teaching them and training them to be leaders in the church. And the same would be true for us today. A disciple must answer that call to step away from the crowd, to lead. Hebrews 13, seven tells us, remember our leaders who spoke to the word of God to us, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Is that us? Are we leading a life that others could imitate, that others could look to and follow? Fifth, being a disciple takes discipline. I mean, those two words, they're so similar, right? Disciple, discipline, it takes discipline. A disciple accepts the call to live like Christ every single hour of every single day. We live by example. The example that Jesus set for us when he spoke the words in John 9, he says, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. A disciple doesn't follow Christ only when people are looking or only when it's convenient or only when it's acceptable. We, you know, we we're just talking about the Olympics a little bit ago and we we're talking about discipline right now. LeBron James is the most dominant player in the NBA. And, and some argue he's the best player to ever live. He's earned the moniker King James. And nearly every day of the year, James subjects himself to grueling physical exercise and stringently controlled nutrition and hydration routines. In fact, he spends $1.5 million a year training just to stay physically fit. In fact, Paul even compared the Greek games to being a Christian. He says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Athletes live disciplined lives, and they deny themselves ice cream and pizza and carbs and sleep. They deny themselves living a comfortable life because they would rather win the prize. They believe the pleasures of the wreath, victory, greatly outweighs the pleasures the rest of us enjoy every day. Paul says, my victory is Christ, so I would do anything anything. Six, a disciple is humble. And humility is a tricky one, right? It is because humility is not about being self-critical or self-deprecating. Being humble doesn't mean that you're down on yourself or that you think that you are less than others. Rather, a humble person is confident in themselves. They're confident in their talent, confident in their skill, but they don't feel the need to go around showing off. They don't feel the need to gain other people's approval or their applause. Proverbs 11 says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. Jesus demonstrated the perfect examples of humility. And Philippians reminds us that even though he was God in flesh, he became a servant and became obedient, even when it meant his death. This should be our goal too, to humble ourselves before God so that anything we do would bring him glory. Seventh, a disciple has faith, right? Being a Christian isn't easy. Living by faith and not by sight, that's hard. Hebrews 11 says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. You know, we're like Peter when he saw Jesus out walking on the water and Jesus said, uh, come out to me. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come and, and I, will, I will walk out of this boat. And Peter did fine as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. But as soon as he began to concentrate on all of the negative things around him, he took his eyes off Jesus and he began to sink. And Jesus said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Sadly, we know this lesson all too well. 
Where there is faith, there is also doubt. Why does God do what he does? Why am I living the life that I'm living? Why do these things happen to me? Being a disciple takes a lot of faith in God and in our circumstances. Even when you don't understand them, faith is letting go of all of your thoughts and living by the words of Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Jesus gave his disciples the power to carry on in this world. Even though he left them, he went to heaven, but he said that he was gonna give them that same power. We have a choice. And as a Christian, our choice is to believe, to trust, and follow God's word. Eight, a disciple has hope. You know, it's ironic that as Christians, our symbol is the cross because we live in the hope of the empty tomb. It's a strong hope that Christ promised, and we all know what lies ahead for each one of us. It helps us to endure all of these trials and all of these tribulations that we suffer down here on earth. The Christian disciple, we have hope for tomorrow. Romans 15 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Sometimes we even hope for things where there seems to be no hope. Like in possessions, right? A car. A car can't bring you true hope. It can bring a feeling of contentment, maybe exhilaration, but not hope. Financial stability can't bring you hope. It can bring security. It might even make you feel a level of ease, but not hope. You know, a spouse can't even bring you hope. A spouse's abilities are only limited by what he or she can control. True hope only comes from the one who is hope, and that's God. True hope only comes from trusting in God, even when life is difficult. How do you know if you're trusting in God? Well, I'd answer by asking, are you obeying God? True trust, right? True trust produces obedience, which produces hope, which results in joy, which results in peace. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Nine, a disciple is love. You knew that was coming, right? You know, we mentioned the disciple was a witness. A disciple shares their story. But for many people in today's world, the only evidence of God's love may be by what you do or say. God's love is more than a Hallmark card. It's more than just typing the word prayers on somebody's Facebook page. God's love is the natural outflow of God's presence in your life. It's a supernatural love. The same precious love that Paul writes about in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envy, it does not boast, it is not self-seeking. It always protects, it always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love is the greatest of all the spiritual abilities. Jesus makes it so simple for us. In John 13, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another and by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How can it be any more clear? A Christian is a lover. A disciple of Jesus is a lover. To love God is to love others. Discipleship is not simply believing in Jesus. Discipleship is not even just following the example that he set for us in his life. Discipleship comes when we actively involve ourselves in faith and we are following Jesus. We follow Christ with our lives. We devote our lives to working, to serving in his kingdom. And it is his kingdom, right? It's his kingdom, so we must be willing to let go of all the things that we hold on to. We leave our own possessions and we leave our own passions and our pursuits behind and we devote ourselves 
to his kingdom and his glory. This is what God is calling us to. Jesus is calling us to let go of who we are and to follow him, to submit ourselves to his authority, to serve his kingdom. A disciple is much like a servant, so we serve. A disciple is a follower, so we follow. A disciple enjoys all the benefits of living in God's kingdom, so we obey the king. Are you willing to become a disciple of Jesus? Are you willing to follow him no matter what the cost? Because Jesus stands on the shore's edge and he says, come and follow me. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful sermon, this Sermon on the Mount. And even though we have read it many times, Lord, it still rings true to us. And there is so many facets to explore and to understand that Jesus really did cover everything we needed. This is the greatest sermon of all time. Lord, thank you for your son and for his presence, for what he does in our lives. Thank you for his ministry. Thank you for his love. May we be disciples of love. May we be disciples of hope. May we be disciples each and every day, following you in all we say and in all we do. And if we can be your witness, Lord, speak through us, act through us, love through us. May we be your church. May we be serving and advancing your kingdom. And now as we go about our week, we ask that you go with us as we follow you. Amen. Well, thank you for watching this morning. Thank you for following this channel. Make sure you give this channel a like and a subscribe. You want to do that because we're going to be changing our format as the school year starts. And so we're only going to be doing one more of these in this sermon series. And then we're going to continue over into our school year and we'll start a brand new series. And then uh, the videos that we put up on YouTube will be a little different. They'll probably be uh, ads of what's coming up rather than uh, what's going on currently because we want to encourage you to come back. We want to encourage you to come back to be here in service with us. We miss you. We miss your family. We miss your children. We miss that. And so please uh, come back, uh, start attending once again. Let's fill this place with disciples. Let's fill this place with disciples. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.